Wait. I'm not live, am I? Yeah, you are. No, no, it's in like I'm not um live on a YouTube channel. Wait. Uh. No, I don't think I am. It's just that's that's weird because um we'll <laughs> I'm checking now. Like um <laughs> okay, I'm not live here. Just checking I haven't like gone on my mate's account accidentally. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, no, no, that would be an awful shocker. Um, <laughs> no, no, we're, we're not live. It's all good. Um, good stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. We're uh, ready when you are. Cool. So where I wanted to start with with this, mate, obviously we've had a few conversations now. Um, when I we're first hit you up, <laughs> a few, uh, we've had a couple of pub trips as well in, in between and we've... Um, <laughs> yeah spoken quite a bit and that was actually two years ago so the back end of 2018 um, yeah i was i was doing a project uh, about fan media versus mainstream media as well um well, I, just, I just wanted a, a bit of a, a catch-up in terms of spurs to start with what's 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 changed what's been the biggest changes that you've noticed from the situation you were in two years ago as a fan to now, uh, to now, and obviously to, to give some context, I think, uh, and it's something that I'm going to come on to, that there's been obviously massive changes in general, but in terms of your positivity, your ambition for the future, and where you sit from that 2018 squad to where you are now, what are the biggest changes? Um, biggest changes so far is that we've got Jose Mourinho as a manager now. Um, so it's a big, it's quite a big change and statement from club like you know as we refer to as little old Tottenham Hotspur down the road um the level of um quality of players we've developed and we've brought in well having said that it's only Harry Kane really that we've uh, developed um new stadium obviously I think when we were speaking first um we weren't even in our new stadium yet no um do you think, think you're in a better position mate in a better position mm-hmm yeah, 100% we're in a better position. And I'll tell you why. Because with Mauricio Pochettino, I felt like everything was too much of a learning curve that went on for far too long. You know, any any excuse of why we didn't win something, any excuse of um, why we are where we're at now, uh, look at the positives. Uh, we're always... We, we were at the time consistently finishing in top four. Now... There's more to it than that. We want to get a trophy. We want to do this. We want to do that. And I feel like, you know, my positive, my positivity had really started after we lost 1-0 to Everton. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened with Daniel Levy because this was very unlike Daniel Levy behaviour. But the man got yeah. his checkbook out. He signed Regulon. He signed Gareth Bale on loan. And financially, it works very well on our side as well because Real Madrid are actually paying more of the wages than we are. Um, we've also signed a quality um, central defensive midfielder, arguably, you know, in my opinion, um, the best signing we've made, uh, Pierre-Emir Hoybier. Mm -hmm. um, my, my only issue for me personally is there's a bit of weakness within the centre-backs. Like, we should have gone over and signed Skriniar Instead, we've got Toby Adreld, who's still got the quality in him, but, mm -hmm. you know, he's been going a bit downhill. Sanchez, who I'm just, like, starting to lose the plot with. Dyer, who's just hit hit and miss. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's my, that's my only issue. We've got squad depth. We've got a second striker. We've got a superb left-back, Regulon. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd feel a lot more positive, you know. We're... we're um, We've pretty much got ourselves um, close to guarantee to a Carabao Cup semi-final, yeah. I believe. Hopefully, should we beat Stoke um, yeah. after beating Chelsea in the penalties. Um, Europa League, you know, will qualify. It's just about uh, through the to the knockout stage. It's just about where we finish in the table after that uh, shocking result against Antwerp. I'm, I'm yeah. feeling more positive than uh, last time we spoke about Tottenham. That really does surprise me. And not that I haven't heard that take before. And I think there's a lot of good things that are going for Tottenham, Tottenham and Mourinho. And I think that documentary, although I think it probably was was a little bit biased in terms of the level of coverage of what Mourinho did and 
less so the change and the differentiating, <laughs> differentiating uh, factors towards that. Um, I, it, yeah. it, I, I guess the point I, I was gonna I was gonna make is whilst it wasn't going well under, under Poch and, you know, even getting to that final, the amount of losses in that season and there were definitely things that were going wrong. I'm just, I'm so, I am shocked at how quickly Spurs fans as a fan base said, all right, this would be better given how stereotypically Mourinho, Mourinho sort of stints go. Uh, and I know it's a cliche, but it, do you not think, do you not think that just backing him in the way that you say Mourinho has been backed, would that not have been better for in terms of continuity for you? So you talk about... Um, okay, so, all right, I'm going to answer this in two different ways to answer yeah. the last thing you said about continuity. The thing is, is that Jose Mourinho's first season at Tottenham, it doesn't matter how you look at it in terms of hindsight or whatever, people knew despite how much uh, fickleness you will get in ev any fan base, this mm -hmm. was an experimental season for Jose Mourinho. Jose Mourinho needed to look at what he's got in front of him and um, how he can work along with it. You know, his experimental season essentially wasn't great, but that was because he was taking over pretty much a ship that was close to completely sunk by Pochettino. Mm. Um you know, and then you've also got, you know, these like reports of Ndombele and Mourinho falling out at the time. I mean, you don't see that now because Ndombele is now pretty much getting guaranteed starting 11 football. Um, yeah. the, the, the question of when, of when backing him is just down to the fact of the nature of our board. For some, for whatever reason, our board didn't want to rush it and start backing him um, out of, you know, panic signings. I think, you know, you look at it back in hindsight and just have to accept the season was a write-off. Yeah. Um, let, let, let time adapt. Let's see what weaknesses we have, even if it's, even if it's more than obvious, because obviously then we've got to try and find the right player to, um, fill out for those roles. Hence, uh, Pierre and my Hoiberg, you mm -hmm. know, from Southampton, who I didn't particularly rate at all at Southampton. He's now like a complete different player and, you know, so both Tottenham and Southampton fans are very shocked of the level of impact he suddenly got to offer for this club. Yeah. The, 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 the defeat in itself at Everton, I feel like, was a reminder that things haven't changed. This is still the same season of Mourinho's first takeover, essentially. And that's why signings needed to be made. And it's clear that Levy did get Mourinho, not just for, you know, to say, oh, look at me. We're a club that has got a big manager like Jose Mourinho. But also to back him. Now, to focus on your point about Jose Mourinho being a dinosaur, all I need to say is you need to look at... Didn't, um, quite, say, didn't quite use that turn of phrase, but yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. Like well, 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 Some people say he is a dinosaur. No, no, no not, not you specifically. I meant the words that came out of mm -hmm. your mouth was that Jose Mourinho can be referred as a dinosaur by people, yeah. I mean, you saw in the Amazon documentary how he reacted to that. Yeah. So switching the TV off. Um, <laughs> but... Um, you need to look at the latest um, game that we had against Man United, 6-1. Same players, more or less. A few new faces like um, Bruno Fernandes, um, Daniel James, Harry Maguire. A few, few new faces, right? Mm -hmm. But you look at how that squad just crumbled under their current manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, at the time. You know, Harry Maguire still getting games for England. Um even a fight breaking out between Bruno Fernandes and Harry Maguire in the changing rooms, which is why you didn't see Bruno Fernandes play the second half against us. This, in my opinion, and I think it's pretty clear evidence that it wasn't down to Mourinho being a dinosaur, hence why he got started getting that reputation at Man United. The reason is simple. He, he managed a group of bad eggs who were not committed enough into changing themselves as players and didn't put in the work that their manager told them to. Mm. Now, if it was really Jose Mourinho like that, you would have had bad eggs like, I don't know, I don't think Ndombele is a bad egg personally, but he was definitely mm. getting frustrated. You would have seen, you know, the same antics from Man, from Man United from his last season there at Chelsea and the other time when he got sacked. I think Mourinho has used this time personally for me to mellow down as a manager Mm -hmm. So we haven't actually seen the worst of Mourinho, if I've got to be honest with you, in terms of, you know, be, uh, behavioural issues. 
So for me, I don't think Mourinho is a dinosaur. I think it was it was dependent on the circumstances of who he managed, i.e., Man United, and how that and how that played out for him. Yeah, I, and uh, I mean, are you sort of hinting that maybe potentially because what people would say to that is obviously, you know, that that discontent did come in the later season, so season two and three. Uh, Chelsea the second time, two and three Real Madrid, two and three with United. I mean, arguably you're you're not you're not at the stage where those problems start to come to light, are you? Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not going to blindly say it won't happen at our club because I'm sure you know Mourinho isn't really here for the long term. I'm sure he'd want to like manage maybe what at least one other club before okay. before before, before he's he's done with Tottenham. You know, this yeah. is just down to whether. Mourinho can win a trophy for us this season or not. I yeah. don't want to jinx it personally, but I feel like, but what I will say is, is that this season, yeah. our chances are much better to win a trophy. You know, we got, we got the players, we got a manager who is a serial winner. Um, he mm -hmm. wants, his, his aim is to win a trophy. So I, I'm, I, I'm just I hoping do. he can do that. I do. And although, I think Mourinho probably has been disrespected by the media and rival fans because of recent history. I did, I have seen a change in his overall manner. And I think that documentary definitely did expose a side of Mourinho, I guess the more personable side of him that, you know, speaking to someone outside Tottenham looking in, it definitely, cha it definitely changed the way I look at him. And I do, I've always thought he was a fantastic manager and I think the difference, which is actually really positive for you, is he genuinely does have to find himself in a position where, not to not to disrespect him, but his stock is lower than what it was going into Chelsea or Man United. So he has to kind of take a different approach. I think he's got a better, better squad than he had with United. Uh, I think Spurs are best place to challenge outside, uh, outside Man City and Liverpool. A lot of people would disagree and say Chelsea, but I, I think the group of players yeah, he's got there. Chelsea, <laughs> Chelsea title contenders, do me a favour. No, I, I genuinely, I do think you've got a lot of good things going going for you there. And one final thing I wanted to ask you: a big theme. And sorry to keep going on that that documentary, but it did it did show a lot. It did show a lot as well as as well as your your appearance in the start. Of it. <laughs> good. Um, a big theme is that thing of, you know, we want you to be. Do you see Tottenham as a more aggressive, a, a more ruthless, a meaner team? Because that was what we really tried to drive home. And I had noticed that because I always think you never want to be the team that isn't hated. Leeds fans have it have it now. It it gets on their back. It gets on their backs that they're not they're not as hated as they were twenty years ago. It's, it's never nice, in my opinion, to be a team. And I think Tottenham played brilliant football sort of between 2013 and 16, 17. They were everyone's second favourite team. And the reason was because they didn't dominate in terms of winning those trophy, trophies. And I always I think that that's a real key point that he hit on there, that he wants to make Spurs dislikable. He wants, he wants them to be the team that are sort of combative, um, you know, we're all for one, work really hard, got that edge. Do you, you see it developing in that way? Yeah, there's definitely a change of manner there, but I don't think I, I it personally doesn't affect me to start off with if um other teams hate us. I mean, what what you're saying yeah. is in in terms of Tottenham being everyone's second favorite team, that's because well, most of them are probably not a London supporting club. Not from your own of course. Well, Arsenal and Chelsea pretty much link up together to hate on Tottenham, you know, like, so that, that, that says enough as it is. And I'd rather that was the case, to be honest, because I don't want to link up with another London rival club to hate on another. So hate us by all means, you know, Millwall, no one likes us. We don't care. Let's take that yeah. method and manner. Yeah. But um, yeah, I know what scene you're referring to as well, when he's like um, saying you need to be intelligent C words, not stupid C words and stuff like yeah. that. Um to be fair, Mourinho's right in the sense that nice guys never win. You got to be mean. Yeah. You've got to be ruthless, and you've got to be intelligent. You know, maybe look, I'm not going to lie. Like I won't be biased just because I got the opportunity to be on the Amazon 
Prime series. So I'm going to say nice stuff about it, but I'll admit that, you know, maybe there were a few propaganda stunts there because after all, this was funded by the club itself. So, yeah. you know, it was edited on the behalf of the club, um, yeah. portrayed on the behalf of the club. But, you know, if, if i got to be honest with you, a lot of people who, are, who have not been a fan of Mourinho, Tottenham fans that is, a lot of their words are that Mourinho's really warmed up to them. And that's because, mm -hmm. you know, like you said before, Mourinho wants things done any way possible, be it the good way or the harder way, to win yeah. stuff. And um, I, think, I think that's the quality of Mourinho of a club like Tottenham have needed for ages, which is we needed someone to say it how it is. And you would have def you definitely would not have got that under Poch, especially not to disrespect Poch, because I do appreciate what he has done for us as a club in terms of um, raising our levels up in the league and stuff like that. But with Pochettino, you wouldn't have got this ruthlessness about him, you know, which is why we lost 3-0 against Brighton and conceded another goal in the second half against them. You know, with, with Jose Mourinho, he he will try and nip things in the bud and set things straight. Not all the time, obviously, because every manager has to lose a game. But for me, you know, if, if, to, if, if you have a club where they have not won a trophy in over a decade and you've got someone like Jose Mourinho coming in, this should be the moment to cherish the most um, if you are fortunate enough to get a manager of that level. You know, same goes to clubs like Everton as well, who have got, Carlo Ancelotti and you know now have um Hamis Rodriguez joining uh, who's joined them you know they look like an overall very attractive side all they need yeah. really is another center back and maybe maybe a uh, better fullback I, I can't even remember but they're missing two players but this is a Carlo Ancelotti factor and it's the yeah. same for us a Jose Mourinho factor undoubtedly um yeah no I I, I find it hard to disagree really and I am I am really excited to sort of see how the how the Mourinho project goes and, and where we are in 12 months time with it um yeah first time we spoke you I think you had around 2,000 subs um yeah it, I think that's what that was the figure that I mentioned in the video you know you, you've gone past I think when I last checked 13.8 now yeah I'm just off uh, 14,000 subscribers yeah and that's and I haven't even been uploading consistently so I need to like I need to step my game up. Going to be filming tomorrow outside the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. So looking forward to that. Um, you know I can't let lockdown. Um, you know, and and I'm not even breaking any rules of lockdown. So I feel like um, you know, I hate. If I got to be honest with you, I hate filming indoors. I hate it so much. It's draining and it doesn't give me any source of motivation to want to edit. Whereas if I film outdoors and actually like you know do what I love doing most and you know, get to film outside. I've already yeah. like spent, I've already spent a day out. Yeah. And then I've got something to look forward to when I get home. And that's why this is what lockdowns taught me the most. I think that I definitely cherish more my match day vlogs and filming outside. And I want to, I want to do that more because I'm just getting cabin sickness, just staying indoors, you know, <laughs> that's something that I can definitely relate to. I think it's, it's not healthy to, to be inside as much as we all are these days, particularly when, that was the part of part of your channel with the match day vlogs where you know you, you could see that was that was what you were passionate about and that's that's where you want to be and that was where some of your best content came from yeah um, what's what surprised you most about about your either your content or the or your let, let's say your content post post lockdown and post covid what's what's um, surprised you most about what you've had to do to adapt i think I think I'm surprised that because there was a period of when it was like the first um, wave and that was when there was like no football at all. And I was like just struggling for ideas. Football yeah. comes back and, you know, there was quite a few live reactions that are now. And when I say live reaction, I mean filming indoors. There's a few of them that are now, I think, in my top five viewed videos. You know, the North London Derby, which got to feature in the Amazon Prime series mm -hmm. and our recent win against Man United 6-1 at Old Trafford. So, you know, those two videos surprised me how I was able to film in th this very room itself, really depressing looking wooden room. And yet people still wanted to click and watch my reaction to it. That's what surprised me. Um, I guess another thing that's, um, in fact, it's not, it's not really much of a surprise now, but um, 
you know, when when we first spoke, I told you that the reason why I did this and the reason why I get the audience that I get is because um, it going on a match day gives a perspective of what it's like to go to one if you live if you can't afford a ticket or if you live in another part of the world. But nowadays, if I have to be honest, and I shouldn't be surprised by it, but the clicks that you get for a live reaction are now purely just to see other fans react in a really bad way to when they see their team lose. And I got that from my West Ham live reaction. Uh, not not most viewed video, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think right now it's taken away the exp the intention of wanting to experience what it's like to watch a game because nobody nobody needs to like look at someone watching a tv and saying how do i get experience from that you can do that yourself so mm -hmm. i feel like the meaning has gone a little bit and it now can be it can be a bit of a laughing stock for some and mm -hmm. this like the other but what can you do it's, it's not your fault these are the circumstances definitely not i does it feel inauthentic to you do you feel like uh, do, you, do you ever feel like you, you've got to act differently or your reactions aren't, aren't as authentic? Does that thought ever cross your mind? Um, it's, it's, it's interesting that you should say that because um, I remember like the day the day after um, the West Ham blog and I got, got a fair bit of abuse from West Ham fans and then some uh, proper anti-vlogging lot at Tottenham. Um, I got it again over the summer at Sheffield United and... Um, what what made it what made it more painful was that my dad was in the reaction and a lot of people were saying some very unsavory stuff about my dad, which obviously, you know, as a as a son and you're seeing that stuff said about your dad, um, it's not going to be nice to read and stuff like that because it's like because people can just be absolute nitwits, um, but a lot of them were saying like because it's it's interesting because a lot of people were saying like um, oh like having a massive problem with match day vlogs. But it gets even more bizarre when people have a problem of filming something in your house and telling you you can't do that in your own house, essentially. And a lot of the things I got was just basically like, you know, fake reaction. I look at the camera too much, even though I'm actually looking at the camera too, which is a, it's a, it's a quick glimpse just to mm. check to see if the thing is still recording. Because it's uh, it's an instinctive thing when you're a content creator. You want to make sure the camera is still rolling and that. So the only way to do that is to look at the red dot, which just happens to be above the lens. I, I the, the reactions for me, though, other than that, have always been the same, really. Um, if Whether I watch my team in a stadium or watch my team in my bedroom with a TV here, it's been the same. I've never had to fake a reaction, stuff like that. You can sometimes see me calmly react negatively you can other times see me lose my head especially with var in the game now so you know the reactions have always been the same since uh day one if i can't be honest with you though there are some content creators which i won't mention but it's probably obvious now if you're following content creators that do fake their reactions they've, they've even been exposed for it before on live reactions and it's done circulations on twitter but you know even fair play to them because people will still watch their content yeah, I, I mean, it's to, to be honest, it's kind of that that thing of that goes into it just it, it's almost not even worth speculating about because it just it just opens up such a toxic li line of, of bait of oh what about this this guy this guy's fake this guy this guy does this and I I, I just hate that sort of oh, no, whataboutism culture that that sort of yeah 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 in, not not from yourself but just from sort of. It, it's just it's just all over Twitter and yeah yeah absolutely um I haven't mentioned names end of the day and um, nah, I've, yeah. I've 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 personally spoken to these people before and they've cleared it up and stuff like yeah. that and um you know they've I've I've even had other content creators say to me that um my reactions are apparently fake but yeah if, if the if the camera if I got to be honest with you if my camera was off my reactions would be a lot more obscene and stronger than how you see on camera because i don't want to like because i sometimes i've just got to calm it down remember there's a camera there and sometimes you know camera's a good bit of psychology to you know not lose your head too much and stuff mm -hmm. like that because every every move you're doing is filmed whether it's a live watch along or edited and stuff like that but you know yeah. end of the day 
real or fake these people are bringing um audiences yeah they're building audiences so you know hate is always gonna hate and i think it's a really interesting point you said about obviously having quick glances up at the camera it's such a underrated yeah. part of obviously what you're doing is you know you're bringing audiences a product which you need to make sure is right at the end of the day and the you know the fact that you're you're getting called out for looking at the camera too many times or uh, or you know just trying to make sure that the what you're giving people and i think that goes for the match day blog as well like you know obviously you're you're, you're you know you want the camera to be on it and there's a certain amount of production value that you're trying to give and the fact that that gets misconstrued for for not being a proper fan um i yeah. find I, I find men i find that mental and yeah, it's it's just it's really it's really disappointing to be honest. From the I from yeah like yeah it is. And if I've got to be honest with you, when you first when you first spoke to me, you know, I didn't feel any insecurity of holding a camera like that. In fact, I was very I was very unaware of the uh, negativity. You know, I didn't. I mean, I saw it briefly, but just didn't really look into it. And um, you know, I used to like actually this is my blogging camera here right now, but. I used to um, literally on match day hold it like that so people would have been able to see and you would have seen people's faces and stuff yeah. like that. And I was doing that at West Ham in an away end with some proper, you know, there were some proper nutters around me, I'm not going to lie, and they were giving me weird stares, but I didn't care at the time. But since, you know, since getting a lot of the abuse, as a every good content creator does as that's a positive i like to see it as um i now literally hold my camera very discreetly you know still good footage and that but mm. i just i gotta be honest like i've um i've had i've had um people in the past on a, uh, give me verbal abuse by face i've had it this i've had it last season when you know had just some guy saying um yeah, I bet you're going to make lots of money out of that UC word, this, that, the other. I even I even had someone like threaten to chuck me and my camera on a train track on the way back from an away game. And, you know, I just I just don't want trouble. I want to find a way where I can film my stuff and not cause trouble. And this is the way I'm happy to do it. But yeah, it's definitely it's definitely made me more discreet and go more under the radar. Mm. And um debatably some maybe some slight confidence damaged, but this is you, you you get you get bad eggs in all football fan bases and obviously of course you know by hindsight i should have realized that um you know vlogging it filming yourself whilst watching a game isn't going to be everyone's cup of tea and some people will take it to more extremes yeah obviously and the people that take it to to extremes there's no no room for it and it was something that that we did talk about if you remember um when I when I was sort of asking you about the abuse that you got, and um, yeah. interestingly, actually, that you you touch on that, um, one of one of the quotes you you told me back then was, uh, funnily enough, to start with, um, I was taking more offence to the stuff that was said online rather than than actually the stuff in person. Now yeah, I remember saying now that. You're, you're, now you're sort of you know much more of your content and you're spending I I assume more more time online just because. You know, you're not actually doing as much of the yeah. sort of go into the matches. Is that still the case? Uh, do you um, take it worse online still? It's a good question. That it's interesting. Um, so the last the last uh, confrontation I had in person, I think, was yeah, it was against Wolves at home when we lost um, we lost three two. And that was when I had like some 40 year old man in his forties, I'd say just screaming abuse at me and swearing at me. I just, um, if I, if I have to look back at what I was feeling at the time, I think what I did was I was, I was pissed off at it, but not like I didn't, I didn't feel like personally victimized or offended by it. Like I would normally do if I had something really out of line said to me, I just, I looked at him like that and just, just shrugged him off and I was like whatever and just walked off and then I think he was still hurling abuse at me online I guess I guess it's I guess the abuse in person has taken a risen a bit in terms of you know like how much it would like annoy me and stuff like that or how much or how baffled I'd be from it but I think one of the worst things online is is that you know people have got a keyboard and they'll say anything and the fact that they can say anything 
is more harmful and it can damage people's mental health as well from it. And um, I think I think the fact that we are in lockdown, I will say that people have just naturally got more abusive via social medias because them two are they they they're also frustrated. The whole nation is affected by it, and they want to take their anger out on someone, obviously. And you know the personal abuse, though, I just either laugh at it or on a very on a very rare occasion, I'll I might say something back. Not not like not to their level, but I'll just say something to stand up for myself. Mm. And um, the online abuse, though, I think will always for me it'll always be worse if I've got to be honest with you because um, it's just it's just always the same people, the same sorts of people that would hurl abuse at you. Like someone with like a St. George's flag as their profile picture, free Tommy Robinson in their bio, bunch of St. George's flags. I mean, I don't want to stereotype, but that is literally the amount of things I get is from all yeah. of those. Someone who, someone who loves their beer and someone who loves their um, controversial opinions. So the fact that you don't even know what they look like and they're giving you this abuse and stuff like that, it just, it's just, that is just more of a psychological factor because you don't really know who the person is and you're like who do you think they are says saying shit like that saying excuse my french saying stuff like that but then when it's like in person you, you you're looking at the person you know what he looks like and you know there's there's very easy ways to get out of it yeah no it's it, i guess it's easier to compartmentalize but the sort of root of the not ruthless but the consistent it's just like it just seems a little bit never-ending online yeah but Which listen, I don't want to. I don't want to focus too much on the negatives, though, because I've had, I've had, because I've had more people just praise, praise me in person for it. Um, on an odd occasion, even ask for a photo and stuff like that. Which I'll never, I'll never understand why people would want to do that. But I'm not going to complain. Um, Talk to me about the positives, mate. Because obviously, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. That's that's just one side of it. Yeah, it's just a loud minority, and unfortunately, they can create a bigger impact at times. But you know, you'll always get more positive things uh, chucked at you. Thankfully, from uh, what sort of some of some of the best experiences or the, the better things that have really sort of inspired you to keep going on the journey that you've been um, on? In any particular examples of either fan engagements or or anything where you can sort yeah. of put your hand on and say that's why I do it. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely fan engagement. Like I've um, like I think I remember it was like one Spurs game I went to, and um, there was like um, there was an Australia there was an Australian fan actually who travelled all the way from like Sydney, I think, and he he just recognised me and said in his Australian accent, "Oh, are you Sam Chipek that Spurs YouTube?" And I said, "Yeah," and then he just goes, "Oh, I have your content, this, that, the other." Um, speak for a bit. Can I get a photo? Carry on speaking. And, you know, that stuff's really nice because someone from the other side of the world has recognized my content and we've had the privilege to bump into each other. So that's something I really liked. Um, you know, another moment as well was when um, I was just like talking to my mate um, in one of the outside, uh, one of the turnstiles because I was waiting for another mate to turn up. And then uh, this, I, I don't know, I don't even know how old he was. I think he was like, he's between, he was between the age of four, six years old. But... No, no. I remember, yeah, I remember, I, I remember this as well because um, I saw a brief moment. I think he was like talking to his mum, and then his mum was like pointing, but obviously she was pointing at me. But I didn't think, um, I didn't think anything of it at the time. Carry on talking, and the kid just like walks up to me and just asks, "Are you that Spurs YouTuber?" So what it looked like was the mum was saying, "If you want to get a photo with him, you need to ask," because obviously that's what a mum yeah. would teach their kid. You know what you don't. Get you yeah. don't ask, don't get that sort of thing, and yeah. then um, yeah, that, that that was that was really um sweet actually that moment um, and then also there was um, is I've lost count with it because it just some some of them just happen so quickly. Get a photo by like that, then other yeah. times you know it's conversation. But I also remember it was um last game of the season before the Champions League final when we played against Everton, and um there was this uh, Korean girl who just um literally just like walked over to me and then had like my channel on her phone saying, is that you? And then asked for a photo. And then um, I think, I think it is. Um, the thing is, I think with, um, because I've noticed this with my South Korean subscribers, they are all so bloody polite. Like I don't think I've come across a more polite group of people. And yeah. um, 
the way the way she was talking to me was like in such I'm, I'm just a Spurs YouTuber like, like just like film stuff but the way she was like speaking to me was like as if she was so grateful that my channel exists and she gets the opportunity to watch it and it's a real privilege for her to be able to uh, meet me in person and um, see the content that I've produced. And that, that that's that's another thing I love as well, like the Korean audiences I've gained because of uh, Son Hyung Min and putting his name in the title. And, you know, that, you know, this, I've, I've learned a lot about Korean culture since, you know, I even want to do some more Korean themed videos now. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the, the people of um, South Korea, are honestly, just absolute sound and great people. And, um, you know, every every single South Korean that has um, said he hello to me for content or commented on a video have just been so nice and polite. Like it's 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 amazing that I even generated something on an international um, viewpoint. Yeah, and to go back as well to, to what you you initially said, you you obviously started this to give to give. Well, you said friends and family, but what is yeah. transpired. The, um, people that can't go to the game that experience do you feel like you're I mean from my perspective as you've continued to grow even producing content at home and doing stuff in different ways do you think you're a little bit more than that because you know people it's not just as black and white as oh I can I can see this game I can get this experience of being in there through this guy people are sticking around and people it seems like they they want they want more than than that initial thing. Does that sort of increase? That must be good for you personally to be like, you know, people are sticking around for more than what I originally wanted to do, which was yeah. give them the experience. Yeah, you know, I'm adding, I'm adding a lot more value there with the content I'm making. Yeah, it's it's not just people sticking around; it's new faces showing up by clicking that subscribe button. It and you know what? I wouldn't those pe people say that you know numbers aren't important; just enjoy what you're doing, but. If I got to be honest, you know, those numbers are the reason why I just always want to keep on adapting. Like, look, I'll show you. Um, I've recently, I want to improve my audio outdoors. So I purchased uh, this little device that goes in the microphone. Um, that's because that's because I've realized, you know, I want to up the quality. And uh, speaking of upping more quality. Yeah, so I've recently... Um, bought this um new camera to improve you know non non um match because I'm, I'm never gonna be able to take this camera to a stadium they won't even allow it i think yeah. but you know if i want to film you know something more outdoors you know like a stadium visit all the stadiums in london video that i yeah. did once um i'd have used this camera so yeah. you know i'm i'm embrace i'm embracing what it's like to be a content creator i'm almost behaving like i'm a full-time content creator because I just, I just simply want to have the knowledge and power and ability to create a, a banging video because it is so satisfying and I love editing. And, you know, I'm still learning as I go along and teaching myself. And, um, you know, the fact that these people stick about their positive comments, new faces show up, you know, this is an invitation to, you know, create more. Absolutely, mate. What have you learned about yourself in the past sort of two years since we spoke and, and just in general more recently post-COVID? Um, I think I've learned definitely that um, I've got a bigger fighter fighting mentality inside of me when I want to get things done. Um, what do you mean I've by never, that? I'm not going to give up if uh, circumstances go against me. And, you know, with the amount of, um, you know, lockdowns, amount of negativity threats this that the other i've still shown the same um passion and um dedication to what i love doing and i'm still going by if i if i if i've got to be honest i i don't think there's anything in my i don't think i've ever shown this level of consistent um passion and dedication to anything in my life like be it um be it jobs be it um, hob hobbies that um, have been phases. Mm. It, if I've got to be honest, uh, be it even um, even like amongst friendships or relationships, because I'm like in my room just editing and editing and editing, and um, you know finding ways to um, 
finding ways to just um you know being able to multitask but i feel mm. like i feel like it's got past way more to the stage that you know there's i don't think there's i don't think there's anything you can do to like get me to stop doing this you know even if i have a job that isn't related like a sales job i had at one point i still i was still doing my youtube and making sure things don't get in the way in fact uh in fact that was the, that was kind of the reason why i actually uh, quit a job previously you know the work people were sound my boss was sound but you know i was struggling in that workplace sales isn't for me and mm. um you know i was just like noticing how youtube was slightly deteriorating a bit and i didn't want this to happen and i wasn't happy with where i was so you know i was getting sponsorships as well before lockdown so you know i didn't i didn't, I didn't want to throw this opportunity away even even if it's a gamble, I'll I, I will happily gamble with this. You know, the thing mm. I learned more is is that this is this is my number one passion, and um, no, no, nobody's there's. I don't think there's anything that will ever replace it or take it away from me. You know, the editing videos, doing YouTube. You know, my my housemate that is living with me is the very reason you know why he's here because you know he started off as a, as a subscriber. Saw him on match days. We became mates, and now we live together. This is, and this is this is simply because of what I've done for YouTube wise. Who knows what the future can bring at that point onwards? Definitely. Did you struggle with consistency before? Obviously, yeah. this is your main passion, but I'm actually quite interested, um, having had sort of quite quite similar experiences really in, in yeah. recently. What it, what do you think it is that's giving you that sort of that drive and passion to keep consistent with it? Because mate, it's a lot of work and like at any point down the journey you've gone on to you you could have sort of you know it's 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 not exactly like a, a not i wouldn't say a safe bet but it's not it's not like there's this is my pathway this is how i get there like there would be in some some other lines of work there is there is that yeah, yeah. of the anxiety and insecurity of what comes next especially when you go through stuff like you, you've had this year so what is it can you can you quantify it what it is that's given you this well, drive this drive? well like you said um well look firstly if you can edit a video and you can edit to quality you're going to have people that would want to have your skills to do something for them so that's that's one thing that i've done i've edited other people's videos been char charged a service for it done you know there's there's some business and finance points of it that's how that's how i've been making money during lockdown as well you know making making videos for companies that needed editing and stuff like that. Um, ideally, you know, I one day watch just want to have, I want to have my own studio. I want to have my own company or be a part of a company, which, or, or a part of a group of people, which I am at the moment. I'm with, I'm with offsiders at the moment. If you've come across them, um, yeah. it's a group of other football vloggers. We've got an Arsenal vlogger. We've got another Spurs vlogger. We've got an, uh, Leicester vlogger, we've got a Brighton vlogger, and you know, randomly, we've also got an Itswitch Town vlogger, but still produces you know the same level of quality vlogs as we do. Don't it don't matter what team you support, what league you're in, whether you're in Premier League or League One. Um, you know, this, 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 this for me right now is the best time to just um, get to my prime and um, carry on editing. You know, there's 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 other YouTubers as well. You know in their thirties who are doing so well, like uh Smith who I had the uh, pleasure of uh, interviewing. There's uh Spencer who's now even got his own um, registered FA football club, um, hashtag United, who I got to see in an FA cup uh, game, which unfortunately lost in penalties, but it was still a great game. Um, I'm even, I'm even launching a second channel very soon for, you know, podcasting. So, you know, if I got to be honest with you, I want to do other things as well. I just don't, mm. I don't want to just like film, you know, Tottenham content. I want to be there with my camera, filming, having fun, producing content and, you know, making smiles on, giving smiles to people and um, letting them enjoy the content I produce. Definitely, mate. The, uh, the hashtag story is just mind boggling. It's, un <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Too. <clears throat> it, it, what the sort of the journey he's gone gone on and the fact that we're talking about you know a, a team with the inceptions it's just it, it's more the fact for me that even like 20 years ago a story like that wasn't possible it, it just oh, obviously yeah you could start a team but you know to to have such a back in and come up the leagues like they like they have and they're they're going to is it's just fascinating to be honest um well 
it's it's um, not difficult what, what he had to do. It was just f- about about finding the right people because it, it's very quickly. It just started off as like a YouTube kickabout, you know. But he yeah. wanted to go another level, and what he did was he basically binned off pretty much all of the YouTubers. He binned off um, binned off even Theo Baker, I believe, um, which you know Theo Baker understood, but he still he still goes to hashtag games. This is just uh, increasing yeah. level. It's got to the point where even Spencer and his brother can't play in the team anymore because, you know, they need proper footballers. They got a scouting system and found very decent semi-professional footballers, you know, beating teams that are two leagues above them and stuff like that. And you're seeing the same thing with Blood Brothers, you know, with with DTFC, you know. Um, DT, start, DT started by uh, leaving AFTV FC after his altercation with Mark Goldbridge. Got put some investment in and found some semi-pro players. It's dedication and it's um, scouting yeah. and it's knowing your football. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Have you um, have you collaborated? Because uh, f- fill me in. What's been sort of your uh, some of the best people that you've either worked with or been engaged with in in the last sort of last sort of couple of years? Who have you really enjoyed enjoyed working with? Um, I've done I've done a few videos for um, Thogden or helped him out for yeah. a few videos. I think that's been pretty amazing. Thogden, considering Thogden is pretty much the face of football vlogging. You know, there is yeah. no there is no argument in that. Um I think as well, you know, the opportunities I've got um from Channel Four run by um uh, Robbie Lyle, who is the AFTV presenter. Um getting getting a call from Amazon um producers and asking for my co- for my content. So, what was that so, like when you, when you got that call? What was what was your first reaction? I hanged up. I thought it, <laughs> I thought it was a pro, I thought it was a joke. I was like, I think I think someone must have given my number, and I was just like, uh, and I the reason why I remember why I hanged up was because um, someone tried to prank me once. One of my own mates, because um, there's this like there's this renowned renowned um football twitter troll called j mac i think and he was doing an insta live stream of prank calls and um someone gave my number and he I, he legit yeah. called up and i picked up and saying this is an opportunity for sky sports with sky sports i fell for it for about 20 seconds yeah. and i was like i'm only communicating by email from now on so yeah. you fast forward two years later um yeah they called up and i was just like i was just like straight up hanged up and then mm. i went on my email and then I got the email and saw that, you know, uh, there was a bit, I think it was miscommunication with your call, blah, 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 blah. And I just looked at it, looked at the name, looked at the company, and I just like quickly Googled. And I was like, oh no, they were being for real. So I called them straight back up. <laughs> um, but I got to be honest, I was worried at first because I didn't know Amazon was like created by, or Amazon was um, sponsored by Tottenham and uh, portrayed by Tottenham and controlled and edited by Tottenham. So, you know, I didn't want this to be a Sunday until I die, until they spoke mm. to me down the phone and, you know, explained how it was. I wouldn't mind doing work with them again because, um, you know, my main worry was being made to look like a laughing stock or something like that. And then, yeah. you know, getting more abuse from it. But it wasn't the case at all. It was the complete opposite. Mm. They need to do they need to do a season two. It's simple as, you know, if we win a trophy and they don't do a season two whilst we whilst we <laughs> might win that trophy. They got to do a season two, all or nothing. Sure. You can't leave yeah. it on nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure there'll, there'll be more to come from that. To be fair, because, yeah. Like, I, I think, uh, I think a lot of fans like watched it because they were. Well, the general consensus from Spurs fans was that it was amazing. Uh, they they loved it. They got an insight, but a lot of uh, rival fans sort of just went on there because they wanted to see the full act. And I I understand why, and that would have been, and you know, personally, I, I think that could have been covered in in more more depth. But I I think like there's there's enough there to one and uh, and make and make more 100. Yeah. percent So I, what would you? Uh, uh, I was going to ask as well, like in terms of you, I'm I'm sure you, you watch the kickoff and like you're aware of what they do. Have you uh, are you sort of interested in in doing more more stuff like that, like uh, talk shows if if you get the opportunity? I mean, I mentioned the kickoff. I'm sure there's I'm sure you've done you've done other stuff like that, right? Yeah, I'd love to go on the kickoff. That'd be an absolute dream. But um, 
you know so it's the 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 problem with the kickoff is is that um well it's not really a problem but the kickoff only they're very ex it's very rare they get a guest on because most of them are all mates you know um I mean, you've got. I mean, they've got, they've got a good formula now. Uh, I mean, I, I think you'd have to. You'd have to. They've got a good formula, that. apart from apart from a spokesman of uh, Chelsea. Well, I mentioned his name, yeah. but um, <laughs> all this Chelsea propaganda just does my head in. Um, hey, I, I, I think I think he's, I think he's entertaining. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think to be honest, you get the same. You get the same level of outspokenness from from Hugh, and you know, even yeah, I even, like even, you even a lot. Geordie, Geordie and Lawrence play on it as well. I think that show is all about getting, getting, and not this isn't in a clickbait way, but getting those sound bites that ultimately start a debate. And it's all, you know, it's doubling down on on your opinions. There's yeah. not sort of, there's not yeah, sort yeah. of room for glass half full. And I think that's probably why 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 Rory does quite well on that. I mean, I mean, he gets yeah. dogs, but he's uh, he, he definitely gets um, he gets a lot of exposure from it, and he gets a lot of people talking. I just, I just didn't understand what he said when he was just going on about saying that Tottenham haven't played anyone yet. This, that, the other. When you've got, he, he clearly has not like looked at his his club's fixtures because if we haven't played anyone, I, I get it that fixtures are all different, so you can't say, oh, well, we beat this team, but you didn't beat them. But if you think about it, yeah, if we haven't played anyone. All right, so out of that list of play let, let's 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 pick a few teams let's pick um let's pick west brom let's pick man united let's pick southampton west brom we beat 1-0 man united we beat 6-1 um southampton we beat 5-2 all right now you look at chelsea fans saying they haven't played we haven't played anyone yet you look at those same teams all right man united they drew 0-0 uh west brom they drew 3-3 and they were 3-0 down um Southampton, they also drew 3-3. So I don't understand the right... I just can't understand the writing off when we have beaten teams you couldn't beat. So, you know... I gr- and Man United as well was actually tough on paper because, you know, I don't think there was many Tottenham fans that thought we could actually win this. We thought it would be a very tight match. So don't yeah, don't, write, don't write us off. Simple. Uh, definitely not. And I... I- I predicted that uh, United win for that game, so shows shows how wrong how wrong I was. And like I said, I think Mourinho's got the bit between his teeth as a fan base. I think you yeah. probably operate better when you are the underdog. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's always the better position to be in. But particular where particularly where Spurs have been in the last few years, I think it suits you. And um, I definitely, I, I think it's to I think it's to your advantage, and it will ultimately be to the detriment of of Chelsea. Be honest. Yeah. Um, let me let me ask you, you a question. Actually, yeah, um, what, how are you feeling? Fine. No, Andy Roberts. Well, Andy Robertson might be out. No, Trent Alexander Arnold. No, Van Dijk. Uh, even Joe Gomez, I think, now has picked up an injury. How you might have to revert back to your old ways. You know where where you used <laughs> to play. You used to play under the system where attack was your best form of defence. I mean, how are you feeling as a Liverpool fan right now? Do you think you could still win that title again or not? It was. Uh, if it was any other group of players, and if it was even pretty much pre twenty eighteen, I, I would say no chance. But this team, like, is it's been tested in so many different different ways for me, and yeah, it will. It, I, I can see obviously not having Van Dijk, not having Gomez for a period of time, not having these players. It's going to impact us. There's no way we'll reach the levels that we have been over the last two years, but. The mental resilience, and I know that's cliche, but it's genuinely true with this group of players, gives me it gives me belief. And I've gone from being one of the most pessimistic fans you'd ever meet to genuinely being optimistic in whatever situation they go into. I think City, I would be less optimistic if I'd seen City get sort of get their act together and get to the consistency that they were showing pre twenty eighteen. Yeah, but I think Matt, uh, I think Matip. And Fabinho are more than competent. The only worry is they're not players that are reliable. So we're yeah. we're right we're right on the edge. I think Trent will probably come back. We had we had the international break at, at sort of a good part. I think we can do without two of our starters in defence. Once you have three out, that's where you're going to see the squad um, the squad pushed. We're in a good position in the Champions League, luckily. So we're pretty pretty much guaranteed to go through. I, I think like, Matt it. it, it 
Yeah. Matic can play once a week. He did it in the back end. He played the Champions League, but he's not, he hasn't strung, he hasn't strung, strung six games together in since then, literally since, uh, uh, since yeah. 2019. Yeah, I want to ask you actually, now that you brought up Trent Alexander Arnold, there's a lot of fans saying Van Dyke essentially protected him defensively. And there's been moments where Trent has like been really exposed. Like he's great attacking, but just really poor defensively as a right back. You could even you could almost call him a winger, basically. And obviously, you know, when you've had your results like against Aston Villa, where you I don't know how you even lost 7-2, but there you go. Um are you agreeing with the slight slander Trent Alexander Arnold is getting? Uh, yeah, well, I think that comes more from from jealousy than than anything else, to be honest, mate. I think he's he definitely is more attacking fo- focused now than he was. But I think people forget that the reason, if you did watch uh, him when he when he first broke into the team, it was actually because he was very disciplined for an eighteen year old, um, and I think. Do is he is he the best right back in the league defensively? No, but I think what happens now is because people notice him every single you know error in terms of if he's a little bit out of position or every time someone else does cover for it, for him, it's highlighted to no end. So I think it's a little bit of a bit of a I, I certainly think he's more than capable defensively, and I think yeah. what he offers in attack is genuinely better than anyone else in that position. Than I've seen in the last twenty years. I, I, I'm so I think he's he's an absolutely generational talent in terms of and Robertson as well on the left to get back to back seasons at twelve thirty assists. You're not that's, that's groundbreaking. You don't, yeah. you don't get that. You don't get that from and so much of of that team's success and owes so much. Andy Robertson, and Trent Alexander Arnold. I think. The fact that the kids, he's only 20, what, 21, 22, he's 22, I think. Yeah. I, I think it's absolutely rubbish, to be honest. And he is a good defender. It's not, he's not as good as, he's not as good as Van Dyke and he's not as disciplined as Robertson. But people that sort of throw that are just, I think it just stems from, from jealousy, to be honest. It's like <laughs> a true yeah. Liverpool fan there. The word jealousy, yeah, Mark, I, we're all just jealous. <laughs> wait, I, I mean, what, what's your take on it? Like, do you, do uh, you What's see my it, take like, on it? No, I definitely well, think Trent Alexander Arnold. I, I still think he's a great player, but I think there's, I think there's definitely been some moments where he's just shown to be, you know, at some moments defensively inept. You know, I'm not denying though that. I, th- I think look, you need you need to have a player like Van Dyke in your team. Everyone does. You know, with Van Dyke in the team, he's able to control the back four, and you can see, you know, that it's it's been look, shown more when Van Dyke's been out, basically. So you know. You know, Trent Alexander Arnold's not a robot, obviously. He needs to look at someone to command him. You know, he's not he's mm. not he's not a player of a leader. He's a good servant to when orders are yeah. given to him. And Van Dyke's not there at the moment. So yeah. that's, well, I that's would one say thing. About, yeah, I, I I tell you what you said. What I would say about the whole Van Dyke thing, I actually I don't think Liverpool have been the same defensively since since restart. And that's yeah. not necessarily a criticism, but I think we had uh, the eighteen nineteen. It was early. It was about twenty five goals conceded. That's the best defensive yeah. season we've had in ages. And we would we we had a system and a high line that I don't think other teams were quite ready for. And I think what's happened is people our our levels generally in defence have dropped because we were yeah. conceding a lot of goals with Van Dijk and with that full strength defence. So I think that yeah. is to attribute it to. Oh, you haven't got Van Dyke, so now, so now you're not going to be as good defensively. It is just sort of, it is, it's just hyperbole for me because I, I think what's happened, to be completely honest, is teams are better at. Uh, it sounds weird because you usually talk about dealing with Liverpool's attack, but I think they're better at dealing with our defense and the way yeah. and the way the defense. I think it's more more a case of that than than necessarily being completely yeah. crippled by I- injuries. Like, our team, our team, Klopp's instilled it. We defend in a very in a in a, a similar way. It like the players that come in is at the end of the day, it's Gagan pressing. It's it's combative. It's it's about covering for your mat. Like we yeah. defend as a team, and that hasn't changed. I, I, I just think that teams are better at covering yeah. that. I think it's also down to the fact as well that you know, start of last season, up until Watford, I think 
I think a lot of teams were just basically scared of you because of how effective you were in every single department. But then when Watford actually beat you 3-0, I noticed that other teams, you know, especially I think when you played against Bournemouth and they were 1-0 up, I think, teams were just starting to have a bit more of a go at you and being able to read your team a bit more. But I think yeah. I think, I think, think the criticism comes down more to when, um, you know, like you're, you're not, you have to admit like as of right now and even like as of, you know, even after lockdown, you, you as a team were not as good as how you were at the start of the season. So the fact that there's that slight little drop, people love to basically comment on that. Not not to say that you are therefore now a bad team. You are still, no, you, you were and still a super great team. But I think it's just like the nature of people, the moment they see like some negatives, they will, they'll focus on that. But um, it's, 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 I do feel sorry, as much as though we all like love to, troll and banter Liverpool and you've like called me out on that before calling me a troll that that was that was disgusting what Pickford did to Van Dijk though that challenge and I'm he did the oh, same man. thing to Maguire as well well not same thing but he kicked Maguire and he still doesn't get in trouble for it I think I think the reaction's a little bit too OTT in terms of um you know the amount of um witch hunting it has been called for Pickford and you know some fans even like essentially don't don't pipe off at me. I'm only like reading what I see from tweets, but like yeah. um, mourning yeah. mourning over the loss of Van Dyke not being able to play for a while. But I do feel though, I do actually feel for you though, because Van Dyke is a valuable asset in your starting eleven. He will be one of the first players mentioned mm. in years to come when you talk about that Liverpool team. You know, Van Dyke will be on average between first and second player to be mentioned when people talk about that starting eleven. Yeah. Mate, it's it, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, to be honest, it's a weird time to to actually be uh, uh, be a Liverpool fan. I feel like Spurs, you were you were genuinely on on the cusp of that, and I, there was yeah. someone else who ask you about that. Kind of, you know, like there is nothing else that any Liverpool fan could ask for that we haven't got over the past two years, which is makes me very privileged, and every Liverpool fan. So. For me, I might be a little, it might be a little bit different, but although it, it's almost like any anything that happens now, because what this group, this group's achieved, and Van Dijk, and like you said, Van Dijk, I'll, I'll look back on this period just, and I won't even believe what's happened. It's been, it's been just incredible what they've done. So I do take sort of, um, it, it was gutting to to have him out, but we've been very lucky for for two years with with our injuries. Uh, yeah. Uh, not for a sustained period, like in that uh, Champions League run uh, in 2018, where we reached the final. If we lost two of the front three, we've they've basically played every game for for two years. Van Dijk hadn't missed a Premier League game for about two years until until he got. So I, I did sense that like there was there was something coming, and yeah, I, I, what I think this is going to do is just it's going to test the resolve a resolve of the players. And if any if any group can do this, uh, like it is genuinely them on Pickford. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I, I think if it had it not been that he had previous of doing this type this type of thing, and had it not been the fact that I think Pickford lacks discipline in the ter- in terms of his shot stopping, uh, his his temperament, his distribution, and his, I, I think he's I think he's a loose cannon on the pl- pitch, and I genuinely think that. I like it, it's something that he needs to address himself because it, the yeah. way the way I see it, I see him act as a as a fan is not like other goalies and is not like his counterparts and the fact that you know they could they could award United a penalty after the final whistle through VAR and they couldn't ban Pickford retrospectively like I haven't got and you know that's not to be confused I I don't like I haven't got any hate for hate for the guy obviously I was fuming at the time. I haven't got any hate for the guy, but it was just wrong. The decision was just wrong. And it no, was, it, absolutely, it was wrong. And yeah. Like, you know, that happened to us this time, but you know, that could be any fan, a fan next week. To, you know, if City, and City have already had Laporte out, but, you know, if he goes and does this, that to Laporte in three months' time, and it's because, you know, he hasn't been banned retrospectively, and, or another player does that because the precedent hasn't been set, that's, yeah. that's a real problem. So I, I, yeah. I, I think it was. It, I don't actually have, and like I, I didn't agree with the abuse that Pickford got after because at the end of the day, this the, these things happen. I yeah. strongly disagreed with the fact that no action was taken because yeah, no, I'm with you on that it, one. Like something it, should it, have been it taken. Make, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, and yeah. um, 
probably... Uh, unfortunately uh, for you as a Liverpool fan, if you ever do speak up on that because of your reputation from what other fans describe you as, you know, there's your, you're going to get, you're going to get points scoring like, oh, Mane did this to Edison or Van Dijk did that to this Napoli player. Yeah, but, hmm? yeah it's, it, you know, it is like, if you... It's you, cheap point scoring, it's silly. Well, but, yeah. Yeah. Top. Like everyone, everyone wants to knock you down, and that's part of football. That's what I. Yeah, that's yeah. what everyone does at the end of the day. I, I take it as a good thing because I remember a few years ago when I sort of between, I'd say sort of between twenty ten and, and fourteen. I everyone everyone hates live bands, right? That's that's kind of, but it, that, that's kind of like universal, you know. Not not necessarily in a bad way, but it's they're one of the bigger teams. They like to banter them. Yeah, people people only care as much as they do now and want to rip you dick because you're doing well. So I t- yeah. and that's why, that's why I hated United for for my whole childhood, and that's why I hated Ferguson. And it's because they were brilliant, mate. And you take yeah. any opportunity to bring them down. And what I wanted to actually come back for is yeah, yeah. You, I, the videos I actually I actually went back back on was um, your reaction to Liverpool winning the league. I I found I find that, and I think it's actually probably not in your circles, but from a from an outside perspective, I don't I don't think people talk about that that four one where where Kane Son slotted in and we had uh, Mignolet in goal. Uh, well, okay, had was. It was it was, at, it was at Wembley, and I remember thinking you would given the couple we just had, and given the type of football you you've been playing, you were genuinely on the cusp of. You could have won the league. I, I could have seen you doing something in in Europe as well. Not not in that season, why, but why the season it? before, yeah. The se- the season before, but you you take my point. Like you you, you yeah, just yeah. you'd sort of just been there or thereabouts. You just needed one or two signings. Now, Poch never got the backing that he needed. But why is it that? Because I saw your pain in that video. Why 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 do you think Liverpool doing what they've done? Why does that? Why did that highlight Spurs' uh, failures? The thing about you is, is that I think I think it's a mixture of investment and purely getting lucky with the players that you signed that's got you there. Because you signed Andy Robertson from Hull, and mm. you know, don't 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 sit there and tell me you thought Andy Robertson was going to become the best left back in the world when with the intention I, that, that I, was not I, the intention. I'd say, I'd say our recruitment team probably had uh, a big yeah. a big say in that. So I would yeah uh, adore the right recruitment and seeing the players. But but my my point is is that when you signed. Right. So when you sign players like Andy Robertson, Mo, yeah. even even Mo Salah, yeah. um, even even Van Dyke from Southampton, because people are laughing at the fact that you that you spent seventy odd million, I think it was, on Van Dyke. Right. Those players that you signed, se- um, sentiment not not sentimental. Um. Right. The thought of signing those players was not to win you a title or not to win you things. It was to it was to improve gaps in your team. But those players yeah. turned out to be for mo- a lot more for what they were worth. So that was one. That was one side as well. And then you actually then went and paid and spent and splashed on players mm. for their quality, like Arlison, um, Fabino, even mm-hmm. Keita. Even though Keita's been, I don't know, not not as good as how he was signed, but you know, he's he's been part of a title winning side and a Champions League winning side. So you know, the player himself can't complain, and neither can the fans. That that was the reason for me of why you won the league. A mixture of luck, and then that luck made you realise you can get somewhere, so you made the investment. Am I right or am I right? Yeah, I'm right. So, um, <laughs> with us, we just didn't... We just gazed too much of the quality that we did, that we have. Didn't think we need to expand more. We lost a right back in the process of it. We lost a striker, Fernando Lorente, on the process of it. We had a, we had a solid starting eleven, but we had no squad depth. That was our issue, and um, we were getting f- as fans we were getting way too sentimental. In my opinion, I think we should be binning off. Um, we should be binning off Deli Ali if he's going to carry on like this. We should be um, thinking of um, getting rid of Ben Davis and signing maybe someone who's better defensively. Um. I used to think the same about Hugo Lloris, but not anymore because, like, you know, since lockdown, he's been, he's arguably he cut those sort of errors out, out of his game because I always, I always just there was a period where I every time I would watch Lloris, he would I don't know if it was pot luck, but he, he would just 
he would make some error and that's including international. I remember in the World Cup final, you know, he passes it much in sort of carrier style, basically into a Croatia's... I think that's a bit Croatia extreme to pass. say carrier style, but I know where you're coming from. Uh, well, but... no, the first one, he kicked... He, he, um, you know, from a from a kickoff, he oh that one in the World Cup final, yeah, in the World Cup. Oh, final. Yeah, okay, okay, that one, yeah, that one, yeah. He's a weird one. Has he cut those mistakes out of his game? Well, when was the last time you saw a mistake from him? Not not for a while, but I'm asking from your because you just mentioned that you thought you wanted him out. Well, so. when was the when was the last time you saw Hugo Lloris um, on TV? Um, like when was I, the last I, time? I, and, what you, I, and what did you think of it? To be, I can give you an absolute thing, but I definitely had seen had seen whether it was. You know, things slip it, slipping under or not necessarily absolute disasters, but, you know, saves where you think, oh, you should have got there. You got a hand to it and, and, and it spilled in. Uh, your, um, position, your positioning wasn't great there. I started to think that for a while. Yeah, it's not the case anymore because since the return of lockdown, he's been a close to perfection keeper. His distribution's improved. His shot stopping is as good as ever as it was at his best. Um, he's been our most improved. He has been our most improved player of the return of lockdown and is he a Premier League great, do you reckon? Pardon? Is he a Premier League great? He won't he won't get the respect as a Premier League great because he ain't won a trophy and that's how fans like to pick their players. You know, with Harry Kane it's different, I think, because um Kane is not only breaking records, but it's also the fact that he's English and is the arguably the mm. face of the English national team as well. Um and the captain of the England national team as well that he will get that reception with Lloris. It's just down to how people want to view it. And I don't think, I don't think they will, but I think Lloris should definitely be recognized as a very decent goalkeeper in the Premier League. You know, like your, um, what's the name of that Villa goalkeeper? He didn't, Bosnich, I think his name was like, he was regarded as a decent, but, but anyway, that's, that's what my point is about Lloris. But my, yeah, the reason why we ain't won a league is because our, chairman got very stingy pochettino didn't really um well that's the thing like did did pochettino get backed or did he just not ask for backings because the signings that pochettino you know wanted are have a lot of them have you know turned out to be complete flops apart from you know your handful of players like Gio Lo Celso or um um your ben well uh, up until a point ben davis and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas with Mourinho, he's quickly got a job done and has given us, you know, arguably um, one of the best... Le no, no, not arguably, but one of the best left-backs in the Premier League, Serge Regulon. You know, he's um, competing yeah. against the likes of Ben Chilwell. And, you know, and then obviously you've got your Andy Robertson who still holds that position and stuff like that. So, hey, it might have been down... Is a bit of a, then he's a bit of a yes man then. Um, he was a bit of a bit, yes. Bit of a, bit of a too much. It seems like po Poch's journey in a much shorter space of time and with not the same level of success is scarily similar to, uh, it, again, condensed down to what sort of Arsenal fans felt felt towards Wenger at the end. Now, this this period of contempt was a lot shorter. It was almost, you know, with some of these results are, you know, you can't be losing 3-0 to Ben. You can't, you can't do this. We're not seeing this. But don't you think it was quite a quite a similar journey in terms of especially taking you into a, a new stadium as well? Was he was he not and that's what you won't get with Mourinho. You'll get him if he you know, if he's not happy, he makes it the reason why he ends up like pissing people off is because if he's not happy, he'll he'll make he'll he'll come out in the media and say that and he'll he'll sort of motivate that change from his face. I couldn't ever see I would have respected Potch a lot more if he said this is the level I want to take you guys to. Uh, I've not got, I've, even if those players have turned out to be flops, I'm not able to get to get them there. You're obviously not going to say that on a post-match interview, but you get my point. You're going yeah. to do certain things which put you in a position where I want to get, I want to get you to this level, but the board isn't doing that. There's a way of doing that, isn't there? Well, yeah, that's 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 why I said to you that he was a bit of a bit of a too much of a nice guy. You know, I didn't really speak up when it mattered i think and when he did speak up he didn't make himself look good on camera like his um like when he had a bit of a bust up with mike dean because mike dean said something to antagonize him and at the start of a new season straight after a champions league final pochettino gets into a rant 
a small little rant about signing saying, am I a manager or am I a coach? You might as well just call me a coach, change my title back to a coach, stuff like that. You know, whereas Mourinho, he knows how to handle with these things up until a point. And um, yeah. Mourinho, Mourinho just isn't scared of saying things for the way they are. Yeah. And you're confident. Um, actually, yeah, to, to be honest, where, uh, what would, um, what would a trophy do for the, for the fan base? It seems to be, you've mentioned it a few times and to be fair, 2008, it's a long, it's a long time now. And what would it, it seems like it would mean so much more even to the fan base. Like what, what would it do? And not just on a base level that you'd be ecstatic. What would it do for Tottenham? How would it change things, even if you won an FA Cup or a League Cup? It would it would release morale uh, to, to begin with because we've achieved something and we've won something, and you know a lot of these a lot of these players want to be able to experience a moment of lifting up a of of lifting a cup. That's to start with. It would um, it would put Tottenham on a different surface, a good surface of um, you know they've won a t they've won a cup. It's for the first time, not Arsenal or Chelsea. Or Man City winning a cup in ages, you know, it would be that too. Um, and it's also just to like get rid of a burden of the fact that we ain't won a cup in ages. You know, you want to you want to end that dry spell as soon as you can. I think, I think that's the main thing for me. From from my point of view, I think psychologically you need you need a bunch of winners. Now, if that's a league cup or even a community shield, you need a yeah. team that have got over the line in those situations, and then that breeds more success for me i think it'll be more more noticeable. i think it'll be more noticeable on the fan the fan base people like yourself uh, i think like you'll yeah you you just be able to to hold your head a, a bit higher and have a little bit more of a swagger about yeah yeah it would like i said it would um it would end a dry spell um a dry spell that's been dragging on for too long definitely mate well, it's been a, been a really good chat. Um, was there anything else you, you wanted to to ask me whilst I'm here, um, or are you have you sort of have you sort of gone over gone over everything? It's been really good. Um, I think we've pretty much gone over everything. Um, yeah, just let me know when you want me to click end of broadcast, and then um, like we'll still be on on call, but um, the recording will stop basically. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. Um, yeah, we I, I think the next time. Just to finish off, the next time we we do something like this or I speak to you, where do you want to be with the channel? Going where back do you to want to be with the channel? Yeah, the um, channel actually uh, two parts. Good question. Where, where, where do you want where do you want Spurs to be? And where do you want to be with Sam Chipek channel? Um or anything else that you plan on doing? Um it's a good question. Um depends. Let's say if we were to speak in a hopefully it won't take a year to speak again. Should have put a time say, frame on it. Yeah, let's say yeah. twelve months. <laughs> twelve months. Right. Let's say for the sake um, of an argument that the next time we'll speak will be in a year. Um, I'd like to see my channel have grown closer to twenty thousand subscribers. Um, I'd like to have been able to go to more match day vlogs as well. Like go do some more match day vlogs with hopefully lockdown and pandemic being over. And I would also ideally love it if um, we won a trophy. Don't care which, as long as it's a respectable trophy. As a Spurs fan, good stuff, mate. It's been been really good speaking to you, and uh, I have no doubt that you'll continue to go on, do big things, and I do think that the future is positive with Mourinho. So, I think um, you know, once once football gets back to normal and life gets back to normal, um, we're in a we're going to be in a even better position uh, this time in twelve months. So, yeah, really good to chat. Thank you. Uh, thanks for interviewing me. Looking forward to see your article. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Yeah, nice one. And that.